For most of my life, I've sailed dinghies. I've done it fairly intermittently, in occasional bursts, with many years of no sailing at all. I'm no expert, to put it mildly. But I've always enjoyed it and had a vague idea about going on longer voyages one day. So a couple of years ago, I decided to get more adventurous in a bigger boat. A bigger boat meant I could go on longer trips, sleep aboard for the night, take people along with me, and also head out to sea. I went out and bought myself a Norfolk Gypsy. No, that's not a dodgy bloke in a caravan near Norwich, but a lovely 20-foot sailing boat with a two-berth cabin. In fact, it's 24 feet long, if you include the bowsprit. And just so you know, she's called Shamrock. Over the past two years, I've had a great time sailing Shamrock around in the river and more recently heading out along the coast. There have been lots of new and different technical things to deal with. Engines, anchors, moorings, marinas, navigation and so on. And sailing a bigger boat has also meant I've got myself into new and sometimes scary situations. That's included the risk of colliding with other people's expensive yachts in the marina, getting stuck aground on the bank of a creek for 12 hours, not sure if I'd get off again, and sailing miles out to sea and realising that getting back into the river might not be as easy as I thought. In this video, I'll tell you about the main things I've had to get used to in making the move up from dinghy sailing to a larger boat. If you're thinking of getting a bigger boat, it might be helpful for you. Anyway, let's start with the blindingly obvious and what is probably the most daunting thing about first owning a larger boat. My Norfolk Gypsy is a trailer sailor, and although she's small compared to most yachts, she's still much, much heavier than any dinghy. For comparison, a topper weighs about 45 kilograms, a laser weighs about 80 kilograms, a Drascom lugger weighs 360, and my Norfolk Gypsy comes in at 1,300 kilograms. Add in me and one other person, all the bits and pieces of equipment, and enough food and water for a couple of days, and you're talking about roughly one and a half tonnes in total. That's a fair amount of boat, and it makes a big difference. The good thing is that it means that Shamrock is much more stable. Everyone feels safer and more secure. Nervous, not so keen sailors, such as most of my family, don't feel like they're going to end up in the water every time there's a small puff of wind. Plus, the extra size means there's more room for everyone to sit comfortably. People can even move around a bit between the cockpit and the cabin and sitting up in the small foredeck, which the kids like doing. And it means that in conditions that would concern me in a dinghy, I can still feel pretty comfortable. However, the larger weight and size also means I need to take more care. Sailing a dinghy in sheltered waters, I didn't really worry about anything. That's it, Max. <laughs> Right, board the ship! <laughs> a dinghy is so light and manoeuvrable, you're unlikely to ever hit anything as long as you keep your eyes open. When I capsized, I scrambled aboard again and carried on. When I went aground on the East Coast mud, I just dragged the boat off. And if I'd ever got into a real difficulty, I was only a few hundred yards from the shore. I'm not saying that dinghy sailing has no risks, but the way I was sailing, they were fairly minimal. With a larger boat, weighing a tonne and a half, things are quite different. There's all that weight and momentum to deal with. It's like the difference between riding a bicycle and driving a car. You feel safer in a car, and probably are most of the time, but you can also do a lot more damage. With a bigger boat, you need to be much more aware of your surroundings. Whether that's the weather, other boats around you, the depth of water you're in, or a small child crew member who's decided they want to crawl over the cabin roof just as you're about to tack. And to state the obvious, all the parts of the boat are much, much bigger too. When I stepped aboard Shamrock for the first time and looked up at the mast, sails and boom, I thought, bloody hell, this is a lot more to deal with. While stingy sailing was just fun and more or less carefree, sailing Shamrock felt more serious and definitely more of a responsibility. When you're mooring in a marina, for example, if you collide with another boat, you can cause some expensive damage, even if you're going pretty slowly. 
and while sailing, if you ever lose control of the main sheet or main halyard, a heavy gaff or boom flying through the air could cause a serious injury. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to put you off, but a bigger boat does mean bigger consequences. The other thing with a bigger boat is that it becomes possible to go into all sorts of new and more risky situations which I'd never contemplated before. Being further away from the shore, being more isolated and being more exposed to the elements. When I got Shamrock I thought, now I can head out to sea and sail in much stronger wind and bigger waves. I was excited about going on longer trips in deeper waters, some way off the coast and occasionally in more demanding weather. I've had a fair few moments of thinking, holy crap, this is getting scary. Whoa. But anyhow, my experience and confidence has gradually grown and I've had some great adventures. Some people say that bigger may not always be better, but as far as I'm concerned, the last couple of years have proved that it definitely is. With a dinghy, when I'd finished sailing, I would just pull the boat out of the water, get my trolley, and then haul it into the dinghy park. Very simple, and required no thought whatsoever. Mooring a larger boat is a very different kettle of fish. Technically, since Shamrock is a trailer sailor, I could launch and retrieve her out of the water every time I go sailing. But in reality, that's way too much hassle. Plus, I've nowhere to keep her, so it would be a pretty stupid thing for me to do anyway. That leaves me with two options, either a swinging mooring, which means tying up to a mooring buoy, or a berth in a marina. Both have their pluses and minuses. I started out on a swinging mooring. Within a few weeks, I changed my mind and got a marina berth instead. It's much more expensive than a swinging mooring, but I decided it was worth it. I'll explain. If your boat's on a swinging mooring, you've got to get to it somehow. If your mooring dries out, you could walk to your boat before the tide comes in, but that means your time of departure and return is in a fairly limited window, dependent on the tide. You can't just sail whenever you feel like it. Plus, walking out to your boat means you can get pretty muddy, at least in my part of the world. So if you want to get to your boat when the tide is in, or if your mooring is in deep water the whole time anyway, then you need a second boat, a tender, to take you to and from your sailing boat. On my swinging mooring, Shamrock was afloat the whole time, so I got myself a small tender. As it turned out, I found that the whole process of getting me, plus any crew, plus gear from the shore to the boat in this tiny tender was quite a hassle. It was also a bit scary for guests not used to being on the water. The main thing was that my little tender was quite unstable. When I sat in the stern in easy reach of the tiller, the bow would ride right up out of the water as though I was in some kind of super pad speedboat. That's while I was chugging along at about two knots. Basically, it was very wobbly and any wind or waves exaggerated that. To keep it balanced, passengers and gear had to be in just the right position and it could only take two adults at a time. So if there were more than two of us or we had a fair amount of gear, we had to make more than one trip. Plus, once I reached Shamrock on her mooring buoy, I had to get everyone safely out of the tender and onto the boat. Even in a fairly mild swell, the two boats would be riding up and down in relation to each other, which made falling in or getting fingers squashed between the two moving hulls a possibility. For nervous visitors, the whole experience was not ideal. And since my family were not the keenest sailors in the world in the first place, I wanted to eliminate anything that might put them off before they'd even got started. So I gave up the swinging mooring and moved into a nearby marina. Stepping off a secure pontoon directly into your sailing boat, along with all your bags, is just a million times easier and more comfortable. Of course, I'm paying for the privilege and marina fees aren't cheap. Just to say, one way to make the swinging mooring option more comfortable would have been to get a much larger, more stable tender, like a rib. A rib handles so much better on the water though it comes at a price. If I wasn't trying to make things easier for my family, I might well have stuck with the swinging mooring. I do know sailors who wouldn't be seen dead in a marina. Apart from the cost, they just don't want to be amongst the crowds. 
Not for them the sound of drinkers and music from the marina bar and footsteps clanking along the metal pontoons at one o'clock in the morning. They prefer the peace and solitude of bobbing up and down on a mooring buoy with only the sound of the wind and waves and birds for company. There is quite a science of maintaining a mooring buoy and ensuring that your boat stays firmly attached to it in all weathers. So if you do get a swinging mooring, make sure you learn what's involved. The next thing is the actual process of docking in a marina or mooring on a buoy. In a dinghy, I would pretty much just sail up to the shore or pontoon, let my mainsail flap, and there wasn't much chance of anything going very wrong. It's very different with a larger boat. If there's a strong wind blowing and pushing the boat around, then leaving and entering the marina in Shamrock can sometimes be the trickiest part of a trip. Even more so if I'm going into a new and unfamiliar marina for the very first time. All you can see is rows upon rows of expensive boats lined up tight alongside each other with what seems like a tiny amount of space to manoeuvre. The wind and the tide want to turn your boat in all sorts of awkward directions and any other boat owners looking on just add to the potential embarrassment. When I bought Shamrock, she was delivered to me at the marina by a friendly chap called Piers. Piers helped me to launch her and get her into her berth. You're on a hook yet? Yeah. yeah. So it will now go a little bit quicker. And then he drove off, leaving me with my beautiful new boat. Being single-handed, without any crew to help, it actually took me two days, I'm not joking, before I plucked up enough courage to leave my berth at all. I just sat there making cups of tea, occasionally turning the engine on, and seeing what it was like if I loosened the mooring ropes a little and allowed just the stern of the boat to extend out of the berth. But sitting on my new boat going nowhere was obviously ridiculous. I had to take the plunge sometime. So eventually I reversed out of my berth very slowly and managed to get out of the marina without bumping into anything. I spent two nervous hours practicing using the engine to come alongside a vacant mooring buoy, mimicking coming alongside a pontoon, and then finally felt brave enough to head back into the marina. Approaching my berth, I performed a horrible turn and was about to drive Shamrock's gleaming, freshly polished hull into the corner of the pontoon when, fortunately, a friendly neighbour came to the rescue, fended me off and manhandled Shamrock into position. If he hadn't been there, it would have been a bit of a mess. So that's the level of expertise I had when I began. Two years on, and things are now quite different. I feel much more confident. I can pretty much anticipate how the wind is going to affect the boat when we're going slowly under engine. I'm familiar with how Shamrock responds to the engine, both going ahead and going astern. And I've worked out a way of managing to dock single-handed without too much of a problem. Most of the time, everything goes pretty smoothly. If you've practiced using the engine, know where the wind's coming from, keep your speed down and take everything gently, you're basically going to be fine. But every now and then, something still occasionally goes wrong. Last year, I was coming into my berth at a nice gentle speed with a mooring line all ready to throw over a cleat on the pontoon. I stepped forward in the cockpit to get in a better position and as I did so, I accidentally kicked the engine throttle into forward gear. A stupid thing to do, but given the position of my throttle, surprisingly easy. Shamrock surged ahead at the worst possible moment, straight towards my neighbour's traditional gaff yacht, and my bobstay dragged along his wooden gunnel, causing some nasty scrapes. Make of that what you will. As it happened, my neighbour was extremely understanding about it. Thank you, Colin. But it just goes to show that the sailing gods can always have a good laugh at your expense if you don't take care. When it comes to mooring on a buoy, my limited experience of it is that it's much less stressful than docking in a marina, simply because there's a lot more space between you and any other moored boats. If you muck it up, you're unlikely to bump into anything. But it still takes a bit of practice to come up to a buoy without running over it, ending up short or getting taken off course by the wind or tide. 
My main bit of advice here would be to spend a fair amount of time practicing docking with a crew member on board. I did everything single-handed from the outset and that made it all much more difficult. It's tough to control the tiller and engine and also fend off from other boats at the same time, especially when you're getting stressed and tend to overreact. Same with getting a line through a mooring buoy. If you've got a crew member with you, you can leave them to do the fending off or getting a line through a buoy and you can just concentrate on the throttle and steering and take it all more calmly. Much easier all round. Plus, you've got someone else to blame if anything does go wrong and that's always handy. As a trailer sailor, Shamrock came with a trailer and every year I tow her from the marina to the boatyard for her maintenance work and then back again. Driving with a sizeable boat attached to the back of my car was something that took a little getting used to. When you brake, it feels like there's a huge monster pushing you along from behind and the brakes have about half the effect they normally do. If you're going along bumpy country roads, the movement of the trailer can kind of get out of sync with the car and you experience an unnerving push and pull effect. And when I foolishly decided to try going more than about 50 miles an hour or so, the trailer started swaying alarmingly from side to side. I've never enjoyed roller coasters. <laughs> and I like the roller coaster effect even less when I'm responsible for two and a half tons of car plus boat motoring along a small Essex B road. However, there's a simple answer to all of these issues, which is to just take it easy and drive a fair bit slower than usual. Aside from these little quirks, it's probably worth telling you about another problem I had when pulling Shamrock up the slipway after taking her out of the water. My car is a Volkswagen Passat, a large family estate, and according to the official specs, it's capable of towing at least two tonnes. When I went Shamrock out of the water and onto the trailer, obviously there's a lot of weight pushing down on the tow bar, and that weight pressing down on the back of the car slightly lifts the front of the car, taking some pressure off the front wheels and giving them less grip on the ground. The first time I tried driving up the slipway with Shamrock on the trailer, my front wheels just spun round and we went nowhere. The answer was to lower the trailer jockey wheel to the ground so that it took some of the weight off the back of the car. Not something you want to do over a long journey, but it was fine going slowly over this very short distance. Once I got to the top of the slipway and was back on level ground, I lifted the jockey wheel up again. No big deal. But I have to say, I was very surprised that a car officially able to tow more than the weight of Shamrock plus trailer couldn't get me up the slipway the first time. Clearly, a front wheel drive isn't the best option. In fact, the marina manager told me that he's seen boats the same size as mine easily hauled up the slipway by much smaller cars. I'm not sure what their secret is. Anyhow, the point is that transporting a larger boat and getting her in and out of the water needs a bit of thought compared to moving a lightweight dinghy. When I was sailing dinghies, I never looked at a chart or did any navigation. I just got in, sailed around a bit wherever I felt like, and then came back again. If I was ever aware of water depth, it was when I felt the centreboard dragging on the bottom at which point I'd think about turning round. Very simple. All that changed once I got Shamrock. These days, I really don't want to go aground if I can help it, although I have done, and one of my videos describes that experience in some detail. On longer trips, I need to know that I can reach my destination in a reasonable time, and if I'm anchoring for the night, I want to be sure that I'm in a good position. All these things require at least a little planning or looking at a chart. And when I'm going on a longer trip along the coast for a day or two, then I do quite a bit of passage planning, noting what landmarks to look out for, any hazards along the way, and working out how to use the tides in my favour. It's not complicated stuff, and in fact I enjoy it, and knowing that I've anticipated what's going to happen as much as I can gives me much more confidence on my longer trips. These days, with charts and navigation systems you can download onto your phone or a tablet, it's very easy to know exactly where you are all the time, as long as your battery doesn't run out. When I did my first longer trip out to sea, five miles out of the mouth of the river, 
I plotted out a route following the various boys, one to the next, and had my passage plan and a paper chart handy to check I was where I should be. But I also had the Imray chart app on my mobile, and it was very reassuring, as a novice all alone at sea, to see the little boat icon on the iPhone screen acting as confirmation of my position. As a very casual dinghy sailor, I'd only done small amounts of maintenance on my boats, just enough to keep everything working and make sure it's all safe. I think the biggest job I've done was to replace the stem head on my Drascom lugger, which went okay, but it taught me the hard way about tightening up brass screws too much. If you don't know, they snap. With Shamrock, I've been much more conscientious. For a start, she's a lovely boat and I want to take good care of her. But also, to repeat it again, there are now more serious consequences of things going wrong, especially if I'm out at sea, and I don't want to be in any doubt that all the rigging, parts and equipment are in full working order. So every year I've taken Shamrock into the boatyard for a proper service. That includes cleaning the hull and applying new anti-fouling, checking the rigging and sails, servicing the engine, checking the battery, and where necessary, treating or re-varnishing the woodwork. In terms of electronic equipment, I've got a VHF radio, personal locator beacon or PLB, depth sounder, navigation lights and autopilot. And my additional safety equipment consists of a throwing line, a collection of flares and a foghorn. This is all new stuff that I've not had before. Coastal sailing is great fun, but I'm also conscious of the risks and take them seriously, particularly when I've got other people with me. One thing I haven't mentioned is that before I started sailing Shamrock, I did do a day skipper course. That's a great way to get familiar with all the basics of handling a bigger boat, with an experienced instructor to explain the best way to go about things. There are obviously lots of other things involved in sailing a larger boat that I haven't mentioned here, such as using the anchor, cooking and sleeping aboard, learning VHF radio procedure, tying up with mooring lines, how to manoeuvre with an engine, and so on. But maybe I'll talk about those another time. And so, that's it. If you found this video enjoyable or useful, please do give it a like. And if you feel like going completely crazy, you could even subscribe to my channel. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it, and thanks very much for watching. Now it's time for me to get back to that bloke in a caravan near Norwich.